In 1972, ASPERA, an organization working for the development of Latino youth, filed a lawsuit against the Department of Education of New York, urging the court to order the establishment of a school program for English learners. It was a class action lawsuit that had to do with discrimination against language minorities, and in this case, the denial of equal education opportunity as a result of their language status. Back then, the state didn't offer school programs for non-English speakers. Aspira felt these children were being ignored and approached Latino Joseph Perldeff for representation. The reality is that that rose out of the fact that children were totally ignored. This was uh, uh, one of the arguments made in the court, was that this was like having deaf children sitting in a classroom and not getting any help whatsoever. The lawsuit resulted in the Aspira Constant Decree, which forced the school system to implement bilingual education techniques to effectively instruct its students. The Board of Education quickly said to us, well, let's, let's, let's make a deal. And we said, we're going to go to the judge that was hearing our case and said, judge, we want an order immediately in implementing the decision in Lau v. Nichols here in New York. This decree secured the right for non-English speakers to obtain bilingual education, and it also opened the door for many bilingual teachers who were hired to meet the needs of the growing immigrant population. We have a, uh, a staffers that work throughout the schools in New York City, some, and this one staffer happened to be out in a, a school way out in Brooklyn. A teacher came up to her and said, well, thank you so much, Aspida, for you know establishing this this program because without Aspida and this consent decree, I wouldn't have a job. Bibi Otero, before bilingual education was an established strategy, an established technique, what did we do? Immersion on the fly, sort of make it up as each kid came into the schools? Absolutely. I think that um, even from personal experience, I can say that um, uh, when you landed in a school in fourth grade, fifth grade, not speaking the language, uh, the teacher had to figure out a way to, to support you. Often our children uh, were being put into special education because it was felt uh, that not having English, uh, not speaking English was a deficit. Um, and that rather than taking the strengths of having your heritage language, your home language, uh, as uh, a tool to help you learn the second language, um, it was really seen as a deficit. And teachers were having to cope in some way in their classrooms, and our children were losing out. We're now living through an era of high immigration, but we've lived through them before. Randy Weingarten, uh, you come out of the New York area where they had handled large inflows of immigrant children for decades. And they didn't use bilingual ed as a strategy with the Ellis Island generation, did they? Look, um, I think that, and thankfully, our thinking about all of this has evolved because, you know, you had with kids and you also had it with teachers. With teachers you had, okay, just throw them the keys and let them do it. With kids it was the same thing. You know, they'll tough it out. So just put them in a class and let them tough it out. And I think what we've started to learn, it took us a long time, loud decision was a, a critical piece of this is that we actually have to support kids we have to support teachers in in raising achievement for kids and which means we have to make sure that they have the tools conditions to do that but we have to actually support kids and take them where they are not where you want them to be and ultimately um, even though I don't think the school systems around the country do it as well as they should um, do it and I think that we're seeing that because the um, Hispanic dropout rate is still far too high. Um, that we're, that the, the issue of whether or not you have bilingual education, the issue of whether or not you deal directly with the needs of English language learners is now um, not disputed. Ron so uh, Don Soifer, um, what do we know about mm -hmm. earlier immigrant flows compared to the approach uh, that you might take with a structured bilingual transitional program? Mm -hmm. Well, these observations are absolutely right. We have had a real evolution, um, but we also know that uh, lack of English proficiency costs the United States economy $65 billion a year in lost wages, and that comes down hardest on Latinos and Spanish speakers. Um, kids typically um, graduate or, or move to English proficiency at a rate of less than 10% of the year, so that uh, Latino kids in in many American urban school districts are much more likely to drop out of school than to ever become proficient in English. 
But the old approach, do we have an assessment that gives us something to work with that compares the old approach of throwing them in the deep end of the pool until they learn how to swim versus um, and a, a structured approach from day one that says, I'm going to move you over time from mm -hmm. speaking just Spanish to speaking two languages. I think what we're seeing is that many of the different approaches are all getting better. We know a lot more about how most effectively to teach a child a second language, how, how the ways that that can be done, and the ways to support a teacher to do that. We have um, some school districts have ha had some real success using structured immersion programs that are not to the farthest thing from sink or swim. They're well designed, well implemented, well supported programs that are achieving success much more than throwing a, a kid into a classroom and, and, and making them learn by, by watching. 